Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Troy Lambert, author, editor, and the education lead for Plotter. And today we're going to talk about microtension. And for that, we're going to talk to author C.S. Lakin, who also goes by Suzanne, and that's what I'm going to call her. Um, she's a novelist, a copy editor, a writing coach, a mom, a backpacker. She's also a goat expert. She ran a commercial pygmy goat farm for 10 years and delivered lots of kids. So if you need some goat advice for your next book, this is your gal. Welcome. Welcome. I guess I'm the goat to person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought of that while you were okay. So, so let's talk about microtension because some people may not know what we're talking about. What is microtension and what's the difference between microtension and just tension? That is the question of the day. Tension is great. We want to have tension all the time on every page in our fiction, whether we're writing short stories or novels. Um, tension is just as we can picture, you like um two people pulling on a rope. So there's always some sort of uh, plot tension going on with a character that wants to want something and doesn't have it yet or wants to get right. somewhere or whatever. So this could be even a children's book. So there's always some sort of plot tension. Um, the other type of tension is the tension that you want to create in readers, which is always having your readers sort of um, either anxious about what's going to happen next, wanting to know what's going to happen next because they care about the characters or a feeling some sort of unease because there's there are things happening in the story that arouse curiosity or mystery. And again, those are all great bits of tension that will relate to your plot. Um, and that can come out through dialogue. There could be tension in dialogue with characters not really saying what they mean and you're trying to figure out what they're saying. So there is an overlap between general tension and micro tension. But if you just focus on the smaller definition or category of microtension, we're talking about micro. So what we're really talking about is words, usually a one word or a phrase and how those words create mood and also feel incongruous to the sentence or the paragraph or the situation. And I'm gonna give you some examples to show you um, how this works on, on just a word level, how it also can work in a sentence level and also just in, in the mood level, right? So you can have a character right. that has a particular mood and yet their actions are not really uh, gelling with their mood or they're saying certain things, but what their body language is showing is something different, right? So we're looking for incongruity. And the reason that this is a good thing is it makes readers pay attention. So the whole idea of any type of writing, particularly fiction, is we want to engage our readers' brains. We don't want them to fall asleep. Right, we right. don't want them to get bored. And the best way and quickest way to get your readers bored is to have out, you know, ordinary, on-the-nose type of writing, realistic life, where people go to restaurants and have very nice conversations about what they want to order for dinner. That might be written very realistically, but it's boring because you're not, uh, you're not um, hacking into your reader's brain, as Jeff Gerke puts it, where you, where you surprise them with things they weren't expecting. And that's what keeps readers right. interested. So you should have microtension on every page and it can be something that you can sort of add in layer in layers and you can add in later after you do your first draft. Um, you want to make sure when you're writing your first draft of your scenes that you've got the action, the plot tension, you know, that you have your right. story twists and all those big things. But you can come back in and you can tweak the wording so that you're making the reader feel uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. So it's about tension is big conflict, the big conflict part of your story. Microtension is those little conflicts for your your main character's hiding something or they're not being honest with themselves maybe or others around them something along that line so you're producing conflict in the emotions that are mm -hmm. part of the story yeah that too yeah for sure excellent well that's fantastic with that what we're going to do is let's look at a sample and as an example of microtension i'm going to have you walk through the sample with us okay. and um tell us about first of all what we're seeing here and then about how this helps develop microtension Okay, so this is the opening scene of Gone Girl, which most of you probably have already seen. Hopefully you've read the book because it's it's great to read the book. Really weird structure, but it's very successful because the two main characters are really awful and we hate them, which is very weird. Uh, this isn't the exact beginning. 
the the scene starts with the character with the husband waking up and he notices that the sun is shining through the window and it's this angry eye in the sky and that sets the mood or the tone for something weird right you don't normally wake up in the morning and and use an adjective like angry so this is going to play out at the end of the scene as well um, and pay attention to that because it's really great when you write a scene, if you can sort of bookend the beginning of your scene with the ending, which is what she does here. But let me just get into a few of these uh, parts of this scene. We have the character. Um, it's our five-year anniversary and it's an, obviously in first person. And uh, in deep point of view, we're hearing this character thinking. He walks barefoot to the edge of the steps and stands listening. So it says he's working, I'm working my toes into the plush wall to wall carpeting that Amy detested on principle. The reason I highlighted this is because this is the first little bit aside from the angry sun that stands out to me. And what I like to call microtension is the weight wet condition, right? Or a circumstance. In other words, when you're reading something and you pause and go, wait, what? And you read it again, you might think that that's interruptive in your reading experience, but it really isn't. We do this in a microsecond, but we do hesitate a little bit or even subconsciously uh, a word might give us a weird mood and we're not stopping and going, gee, I have a weird mood now, uh, but we but we do sense it. And so I was just identifying what things stood out to me, what, what made me say, wait, what? I thought it was interesting that as he is standing and listening to his wife in the kitchen, he's working his toes into this carpeting, which is kind of an interesting image that makes me curious right there. Uh, but then just saying that a Amy detested this carpet on principle, it seems, seems like a weird thing to say on their anniversary of their marriage. Okay, so it's starting to roll into a mood that grows and grows. Um, I tried to decide whether I was ready to join my wife. Amy was in the kitchen, oblivious to my hesitation. So here we already feel a little bit of plot tension because he's hesitating. He's hearing his wife cheerful in the kitchen and it's their anniversary. You think he would run downstairs, give her a kiss, give her a present, you know, all those good kind of things that happen on a anniversary, but not. She was humming something melancholy and familiar. I strained to make it out a folk song, a lullaby. And then I realized it was the theme to mash. Suicide is painless. That's the, I think the first few words of the song. But so this, this paragraph right here already sets a lot of microtension up because we have this melancholy song, but she's humming, which is sort of a happy thing you do. But the song she's humming is kind of depressing. It's a song about that's set against a uh, the Korean War and a mass unit and talking about suicide. Okay, weird, right? So we might just skip that and go on to the next paragraph thinking, okay, everything's fine. Uh, I hovered in the doorway watching my wife. Her yellow butter hair was pulled up, the hank of her ponytail swinging cheerful as a jump rope, and she was sucking distractedly on a burnt fingertip humming around it. Okay, so that is kind of what you would expect on a nice, happy anniversary day. Uh, he's looking at his wife, and we think, oh, well, he's just got this loving feeling toward his wife. She hummed to herself because she was an unrivaled botcher of lyrics. And he goes on to talk about how cute he thought when he first met her that she would botch the lyrics up and make up all these lyrics. And he really liked her because she had an explanation for everything. Okay, so everything sounds really hunky-dory positive. But then we get this line. There's something disturbing about recalling a warm memory and feeling utterly cold. Whoa, where did that come from? That just hits us from left field. So now we're curious. There's microtension there. We're like, this is incongruous. Why would he be feeling this on his anniversary, right? Doesn't make any sense. Amy peered at the crepe sizzling in the pan, licked something off her wrist. She looked triumphant and wifely. If I took her in my arms, she would smell like berries and powdered sugar. Okay, now we're swinging back to that wonderful, positive, wifey, happy marriage imagery. When she spied me lurking in the grubby, there in grubby boxers, my hair in full heat miser spike, she leaned against the kitchen counter and said, well, hello, handsome. Again, this is all setting up for us to think, oh, this is really wonderful and ordinary and predictable. But then we got bile and dread inched up my throat. I thought to myself, okay, go. So I yeah. hope you can see the microtension that's at play here, we have reader expectations. She sets up, the author sets up these reader expectations, right? But then she dashes them with this very incongruous reaction or mood that the point of view character has. Right. It feels like something like something's off the entire time. We know something's off, 
We may not know exactly what, but we know something is wrong with this guy. Right. So they may get a bunch of paragraphs to talk about some backstory setting up like that he borrowed money from his wife because she's really rich from, from her trust fund so that he could open a bar with his sister. So we get, you know, some basic setup stuff about the story because you need to do that in your first opening scene, setup stuff. But um, what, what we get near the end of the scene is very interesting. I'm just going to read this. I want you to pay attention to the choice of words and, and especially the, um, I always like the adjectives as being the most powerful words to set the mood. But take a look at this. As I walked toward the bar across the concrete and weed parking lot, I looked straight down the road and saw the river. And there's some lines about the river. The river wasn't swollen now, but it was running urgently in strong ropey currents. Moving apace with the river was a long single file line, <clears throat> excuse me, of men, eyes aimed at their feet, shoulders tense, walking steadfastly nowhere. As I watched them, one suddenly looked up at me, his face in shadow and oval blackness. I turned away. I felt an immediate intense need to get inside. By the time I'd gone 20 feet, my neck bubbled with sweat. The sun was still an angry eye in the sky. You have been seen. My gut twisted and I moved quicker. I needed a drink. Okay, so lots going on here. Obviously, he doesn't care that some stranger saw him, right? All the stranger saw was that this guy was walking to his bar. But obviously, you have been seen is a great bit of microtension because we're like, what are you really talking about? It implies something way more. Plus the fact that there's a sun, it's angry in the sky. The sun sees him. The sun is angry at him. It's casting judgment on him. So now we want to know, of course, if you've read the book or you've watched the movie, spoiler, you know, he's having an affair. He thinks he's going to get caught. He's sensing all of these things we see in this paragraph are hinting at his situation. Um, there's a river that's moving, running urgently with all these currents. You know, what, what does a wild current river do? It sweeps you along and you're out of control and it's going to drown you. That's where he's finding himself in his life in this moment on the day of his fifth anniversary. So um, pay attention to great masterful writers. They will have the character notice things around them in their environment that actually reflects the way they're seeing it reflects their own mindset. These men, which is a weird thing to notice. I mean, why, why would Jillian Flynn say that there's a file of men walking and looking at their feet? Like, it sounds like a prison gang. Like, what are they exactly. doing here around the river? It's so weird. She could have said, oh, he looked out and saw all these happy couples with arms around each other and it made him feel sick because his marriage is falling apart. Yeah. But instead, we get this really weird image of this single file line. We immediately think prisoners. We immediately think he's feeling trapped. He's feeling like the prisoner. He's looking down at his feet. Eyes aimed at their feet. Aimed is a very specific verb she used. What does it con connote? It makes you think of guns, weapons. Right. Um, all of these are very deliberate little elements. So... Um, the face in shadow. He's trying to hide in shadows. There's a blackness. There's a void. Um, walking steadfastly nowhere. I mean, obviously, if there's a line of men in single file heading somewhere, they're obviously going somewhere specific. I don't think they would be yeah. walking nowhere. But to him, it's reflecting back what he's thinking. My life. I am walking nowhere fast in the dark with the current pulling me down. Right. So there's all this amazing emotional microtension stuff happening here. But what are we seeing in the actual action? We're just seeing a guy walking to his bar, looking at the river and seeing a bunch of guys. Walking right. Out. And that's a that's a good point. And then there's not necessarily a lot of physical action here, but there's a lot of emotional action going on. Um, yeah. And that's actually a perfect segue to my next question, which is what are a few things that people can do to add microtension to their fiction? Like just a few quick tips that people can take away. Yeah. So I would say... Think about the mood of your character and think about what they may be trying to hide. And it may not be much. I mean, we all do that, right? We go to like a business meeting and we're trying to hide that we're nervous. Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be huge. You might think, well, I have my story. I don't have like a lot of secrets. I'm not writing a mystery. I'm writing like a fun, happy, uh, upbeat romance or, or a cozy mystery or something. But there's always, there's always something that you can hint at that, you want the reader to have a sense of, but you don't want to come out right and say, if Jillian Flynn had come right, right out and said, it's my fifth anniversary and I'm having an affair and I'm worried that my wife might find out. I mean, that's just like, 
that's just amateur writing and it would right. just spoil it. Don't tell your reader everything. In fact, tell your reader as little as possible. That's what you saw in that, in that scene. Another thing that you can do besides uh, trying to hint at something that you're not really showing a secret or just something that, you know, even the character might not know what's bothering them. Um, but just to, um, you know, use words that will reflect, you know, back what the character is feeling, like that imagery that you just saw with the things that he's seeing around him. Um, I often teach from these different scenes where it, you can tell that all the stuff that's being described in the action feels like it's one thing, but the choice of the words, the adjectives and the verbs make it feel like it's something very different. Um, and then again, it's just that incongruency. What I'll encourage you guys to do is I did this last night with, a, with one of my favorite short stories and I go to it and look at it and see where is this micro tension and then see how can I imitate that? Yeah. How can I add that into my fiction? This is something that's a really cool element to add. So that'd be my piece of advice from just reading about this and, and talking about it is to go and just look at different pieces of fiction in a different light and in a new way. So oh, let me um, just show you this. Yep. Always oh, highlighters, my, always yeah. highlighters. You can highlight on your computer, but I like to buy, you know, paperback copies of books. I like to mark them up and um, get different color highlighter pens. And when, if you're struggling with microtension, just go through your bestsellers that you're trying to emulate and highlight every word, every bit that is microtension and then study it. Look at, like what I just did on that scene, like look at the sections, like you'll have maybe a long section of dialogue and there's no microtension in it, but then right after yeah. there's a chunk of microtension. See how these authors weave that in. There's no rule, yeah. but you can learn a lot from it. Yeah, and how, how did they put it together? So this isn't necessarily something you're doing in your first draft, unless you kind of instinctually do this. This is something you do in the revision process, right? Yeah, unless you're brilliant and you can write it first off you know, yeah. uh, not easy. I mean, sometimes I do, I'll, I'll, I'll write something great and I'll go, wow, that's perfect. You know, but Hey, that's not, that's not how, that's not the norm. That's right? not usual. Usually it's usually something that you plan you, but uh, again, this is something you need to plan in light of your big tension that you have in your book. Yeah. And that's what you've written really in your first draft. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on and sharing with us about um, microtension. I think it's something really important. It's a skill that every writer should learn about. Um, so tell us more about where people can find you and where they can learn some more stuff from you. Okay, great. Uh, well, my blog, Live Right Thrive, W-R-I-T-E, is um, going into its 12th year, I think. I have more than a million words of instruction for fiction writers on that blog. Seriously, you, that's at least a million words. I I did count it at some point. So that's free. So go grab that. I do have more than 10 writing craft books in my um, Writer's Toolbox series. Um, but right now, um, most of my deep instruction is on my online school at Writing for Life Workshops. It's at cslaken.teachable.com. And I'm about to start uh, the next course in the eight weeks of writing a commercially best-selling book or how to write a commercially best-selling novel. And um, so enrollment's open now. It's an eight-week course. We have weekly Zoom. There's more than 12 hours of lectures and all kinds of bonus videos on like on genre and how to do a deep edit. I also offer free critique groups during that eight weeks, which is an amazing extra bonus. So if you want to be in a critique group and apply these things. So what we do is one week what each week for eight weeks, we go over different elements. So microtension is one. We do the 21 senses. We do emotional manipulation. We do high moment character change, backstory. We go into really deep detail. And, and I use this method of taking scenes from bestsellers of different genres and breaking them down and analyzing them. This is really the way to learn. I mean, it's just what Hemingway said. When you read something and it moves you, study what the writer did, and then you go do it yourself. I mean, you know, right. it's kind of no brainer, right? So go to cslaken.teachable.com. If you sign up now before January 23rd, before the course starts and you have lifetime access on all my courses, I will also give you for free my uh, an enrollment into my 10 key scenes course. So if you don't really understand plot structure or how to lay out the structure of a book, you really need this this course and you know there's like 30 or 40 movie clips so if you like watching movies you can get some popcorn and you can like learn a lot from these movie clips excellent well i'm i'm glad that you shared that with us i hope everybody will go check out your courses 
Um, definitely check out your blog. It's one of the writing blogs I subscribe to that I actually read. Um, so that's, uh, that's saying something. There's there's a lot of them out there. There's a lot of material out there. Um, but this is one one that's definitely worthwhile. I did not count the words on it, but there's a lot of great information on a, on a lot of different writing topics on there. Um, and so thank you again for joining us. Thank we appreciate you. it. We'd love to have you on again sometime. Thank you. And thanks everybody for joining us. We appreciate it. And we'll see you next time.